Hi, I'm Andrea. I am a data analyst at Envoy, and this is my team. Uh, I wanted to put all of their floating heads up on the screen, just mostly because they uh, were a huge part in this talk, very much a team effort. And also, I would love for you to go meet them after this and ask any follow-up questions that you have. Uh, they're all really, really wonderful humans. And we're also currently hiring for a data engineer and also non-data specific engineers. So you can come and talk to us about that too. Today, I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to do a talk on improving data reliability through testing for a couple of reasons. One, because unlike in the software world where there's a very strong like, culture around testing, data teams often don't have a baked in like, data testing philosophy. Sometimes we let ourselves get away with testing the first like, 100 rows and then just like, calling it a day. Uh, but data is constantly changing and the implications for unreliable data are huge. So even a little assumption can balloon into something much bigger and much scarier. And also, we've been thinking about this concept a lot at Envoy specifically. We've been really working to improve our perceived data reliability, and we thought we would share some of the stuff that we've done to improve this. So to start out, I wanted to talk about the before time. Uh, for a long time, our basic workflow looked something like this where we would build a dbt model, then we would add some basic tests. So maybe a uniqueness test, and if we were feeling really wild, maybe like an accepted values test. And then we would put up a PR, we would merge our changes, and then we would build a dashboard or a report based off of this. And it'd be like, awesome, fancy new model, data looks great, good stuff, moving on. But in doing so, we sort of implicitly made this assumption that if there was a problem, then these tests would catch that. And it turned out that was not always true. For example, we often run into a situation where a customer upgrades their subscription and then downgrades like a few hours or maybe days later. Our data in this case would be like, yes, new customer. And then, meh, looks like they downgraded. But in reality, this customer never intended to upgrade in the first place at all and neither of these events should be included in our data set. And we see this thing, like this sort of, this sort of issue a lot, both with subscription events, uh, changes, as well as account provisioning changes. Uh, since we sell multiple products at Envoy and offer those products for both monthly and yearly subscriptions, we sort of end up with all kinds of billing changes that are really interesting and unexpected and things we have to account for. Customers might add or remove certain quantities accidentally. Invoices might be removed, might have coupons, might later be credited. And sometimes we even sell things that aren't necessarily compatible with our billing system. Our tests don't necessarily cover these cases, so our numbers sort of start to inch away from our true reality bit by bit. In a more extreme example, our largest customer once accidentally went over 90 days on a payment. And that caused our system to turn off their account and mark this as a churn. In reality, this was very much an accident and it was not a real churn, but as you can imagine, this caused a lot of stress when this showed up as a huge loss in revenue on our you know, revenue dashboard. And again, our tests didn't cover this case because we were only testing our models and not any of the underlying data which means our financial data appeared inconsistent. This issue was super apparent and extremely urgent, uh, mostly at the end of last year when we sent out a twice yearly like, Envoy data survey to the rest of the company and got a lot of comments about how unreliable our financial data appeared to be. This is one comment that we received in the survey, one that really, really hit home. There have been enough errors and mistakes in the data for me to lose trust in most of the dashboards I interact with. We were clearly losing trust, which really, really burned, mostly because the issues weren't with the models themselves that we were building, but rather with the upstream data and the sources that we were using. We spent a ton of time and energy like building the model and then like adding tests and making sure that everything was good, and then accounts would be provisioned incorrectly billing issues went unresolved, and then that all flowed down to our dashboards and reports, which was really frustrating on a couple different levels. So even like small discrepancies during meetings between certain numbers, if we were a little, little bit off, that might throw the whole meeting off if it was noticed. Or if it was unnoticed, 
that might compound into something really big and scary where our partner teams were then using that incorrect data to make really big and strategic decisions. So we didn't have a great system in place for this. And ultimately we were still responsible for all of these numbers. So we asked ourselves, like, what can we do to improve? And then we made a game plan. I also love Gravity Falls. It's like a whole nother conversation. But um, our first thing was we really knew that we had to, we had to determine uh, clear responsibility for all of our test failures. So in the before time, which I mentioned, before we committed more fully to our financial QA, we just run a bunch of tests all at one and just like spam a, a Slack channel. There were two main problems with this. One, it really wasn't easy to tell which test failures were important since we were sending them all at once to one spot. And also maybe more importantly, we had no idea who should fix them. It wasn't clear who should fix them or if I should investigate or if you should investigate. It was like very difficult to figure out. We also didn't want someone who wrote like a particular test to have to be the one to debug it every single time. That's not fair or fun. So we definitely knew we had to do something about that. Second, we figured we'd need to build some very specific DBT tests, some custom tests to make sure that we would catch all of these problems as they existed and ensure that all of the tests and test failures were actually meaning something. That way we would see the test failure and we would be like, cool, that is actually wrong and we feel motivated to fix it. Finally, we knew we wanted to track our progress and adjust along the way, just to confirm that we were actually doing what we were saying we were doing and making progress. We figured this would be a very long and iterative process, and so we wanted to check in along the way. So step one, determine responsibility. I love this meme. Uh, to do this, we basically started a weekly pager duty QA rotation. So each week, a different person on our team takes responsibility for investigating test failures and fixing them. This solution has a couple of really cool added benefits. One, that we rotate responsibility, so no one's stuck fixing the same problem over and over and over, week after week. We also get a chance to learn about models that we didn't write ourselves, and we get to fix associated tests with those models. Additionally, we fix issues much faster this way. We can collaborate and learn stuff about models that we didn't build and didn't know in the first place, and just work together as a team, because we have a clear owner. This is what it looks like at Envoy for us to do this. So this is our data QA channel and one of our high priority test failures that came through. So this is one of our like P0 financial test failures. And on the right are some examples of conversations that we've had in that channel. So this is Cameron asking if anyone has experience fixing a particular test. I'm asking Cameron if he'd like to you know, pair on a fix the next day for some problem that we ran into. Uh, Steven and Arvin are updating the team on an outstanding request from billing to get a certain test fixed. And this is Jason and Arvin celebrating particularly good weeks on QA. Lots of claps. Next, we wanted to build more specific DBT tests. So previously we had all of our tests running together, so we couldn't really judge the severity of any particular test. So we split up our tests into two primary testing suites, P0 and P1. These include like schema tests that I mentioned before, so unique, null, that kind of thing. And then also custom data tests. And these ones check all of the core assumptions, or as many as we can think of, about our key models. So in the case that I mentioned before, if there's a subscription that is updated and someone upgrades, that results in increased revenue, is there also a downgrade event that happens shortly after that negates that event? If so, let's throw in errors that we can remove those events and keep the data clean. So our P0 testing suite is our highest priority set of tests because it tests all of our financial data. And then our P1 conversely, like it tests non-financial data uh, and runs every three hours, like for example, our product models. Then we run a source freshness suite uh, to make sure that our data pipeline is healthy and we're actually receiving all the data that we've instrumented from those sources. That's sort of what it looks like, grouped by priority. And then this is what our testing schedule looks like. So we have a main build that runs models that only need to be updated daily, so once a day. And then we have a uh, three hour build, which is where we have our financial data models. Then the P0 and P1 test suites that I mentioned, and finally our source freshness test. I told Claire that these slides were boring, but she thought they were interesting, so here they are. There you go. Um, some things that have worked for us when it comes to building more specific DBT tests and improving our overall process. I tried to list a few, there are many more, but 
The main one is that we scheduled a monthly data QA retro. So our, this is a time when our, our team comes together and talks through any of the issues that popped up in the last month. We've made so many improvements because we've had this time to actually discuss what's gone wrong and to review our process and figure out what we wanna do, brainstorm to improve. A few of the lessons that we've learned, uh, try to add custom data tests anytime we encounter an unforeseen issue. We figure if it broke once, it will likely break again, and it does. We adjust our DBT tests to like warn if basically we're getting too many false positives and we're getting like a lot of test failures for something that isn't necessarily an issue. We also try to comment in our tests with instructions on how to debug them. That one's really important for our future selves and for our team so that we can remember like how to fix a problem when it comes up later. And then our data QA rotation also includes any failures that happen for our BI tool, which is Looker. So if there are reports that are broken, those are also caught in the content validator and sent into our QA channel as well. So that person on QA that week is responsible for helping to uh, fix those issues as well. And then lastly, we added a custom test reminder to our PR template, which means that when you, when you basically put up a PR, it'll remind you like, hey, did you write custom tests for this new model? Are you in so much of a hurry that you might have forgotten to do that? This is a good way to remind us to make sure that we write these tests. And finally, uh, track progress. So these bars here represent the number of times that we ran something like our main build or our testing suite, like our P0 build that I mentioned. And the line represents the percent of successful runs. That is when no errors are returned. We still have work to do to hit our like 70% uptime goal for our financial, like our P0 test suite, but we're really working on it. And we've actually made a great deal of progress in this regard. So back in May, our success, our success rate was around 20%, which is not good. And then last month it was around 60, which is huge. And the really important thing here, it's actually not on this slide, it's on the next one, um, is that when we sent out the data survey again, this is earlier this year, our overall satisfaction rating, which is how other folks at Envoy feel about our team and our work, increased from 3.5 to 4.3, and it gets even better. There was not a single mention of financial data inaccuracy in that, which is really, really cool. Like, re like still feels good, really, really good. It actually feels kind of like this. This is one of our favorite gifts and one we've been using more and more in our data QA channel. I think it really sums up like how we feel when we're able to deliver really accurate financial data despite all odds coming our way. If you want to feel this good too, consider sending out a data survey. I'm happy to share the survey template that we use here for those who might find that useful. Also remember to check your assumptions, write custom tests on the models that you build. It's huge. It has been a huge value add for us. Reduce testing noise and test your most important models. Determine clear responsibility on your teams. Track your progress and iterate. Thank you. Think maybe questions? One or two? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I wish I had a really good answer. I think it has been a lot of trial and error for us. We've, you know, we built some of our best tests, I think, from the most common errors that we actually encounter. And it's because our end users find those issues in the dashboards because we sort of see them happen. We have um, kind of ways internally that we, you know, we basically can see certain models the ones that are used the most, the ones that people view the most, and think like, how can we test these to make sure that these ones are actually like reliable and good? That's sort of why we focus mostly on financial data, but it looks different for every team. And obviously, you know, what this looks like for marketing is very different and a lot more nuanced and very different. So if you want to sort of talk to some, some of the rest of our team that focus more on those things, I'm happy to direct you. So maybe we can talk after. Any other questions? No? Cool. I'm all done. Great, thanks.